For those of you, they are here. Their instrument is set up in room 2C260. Uh, they've been running some samples for Neuroseq project team. And uh, I forget what room you're sitting in. 2C181? In the middle, somewhere right there. Somewhere around there. 161. Yeah, that's where they'll be. That's where they're sitting if you want to go in and talk to them. And uh, so welcome. They've been enjoying Jamelia for a couple of days now. And I'd like to hear more about their on-chip damage-free sort. Yes, we took the long way, the, the scenic route from Rockville uh, uh, all the way across the ferry. So we've got a good uh, local view of the land and uh, pretty nice that way. And uh, first time, I think, for all of us to uh, Janelia, and so uh, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Um, we, we met Kevin and Jenny uh, originally at the NCI user group meeting, uh, which was put on by uh, Bill Telford and the user group there, and, and uh, had a good opportunity to both uh, show off the, uh, uh, give a little presentation and kind of uh, uh, show off with the vendors there. And then uh, we actually ran a demo at the NIH for a week at uh, Raphael's lab in Building 10, and uh, got a pretty pretty good cross section of users there, both in uh, uh, neuron, retinal, kind of uh, challenging retinal cells. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, mouse cochlea cells. Uh, I'm kind of gonna walk through a little bit of that. Um, the the on chip sorter is. Uh, uh, the, the on-chip sorter is all about uh, damage-free. The, the major uh, deliverable of the instrument is that it's 0.3 psi, which is lower than the uh, osmotic pressure in the eye. I'm told. So, uh, pretty pretty interesting in that way. We're, we're the only uh, uh, true microfluidic sorter, uh, and we're on the market, and we're we're really the 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 number one uh, kind of damage-free offering right now. So, so we'll walk through a little bit of uh, what what damage-free means and uh, what are its uh, advantages and uh, and uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, Akagi San is going to go through a little bit the, the the differences with the conventional sorter and a little bit of the architecture of the system. I'm going to start by walking through a little bit of kind of diverse applications and where it's. Uh, where it has a home and where we're, we're finding a need. So just first off, a little bit of uh, acclimation to get uh, familiar with the system itself. Very, very small footprint. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's a heavy instrument, but it sits right in any bench top, and it, and it actually is it's non-aerosol, okay, which is uh, the requirement of the NIH uh, right now as far as biosafety. I'm um, talking uh, directly with Kevin Holmes, who runs the kind of the biosafety requirements at the NIH. We met on Friday. Uh, you know, this is pretty interesting. It's a semi-closed system. Uh, you'll see that the chip is open uh, on the top and aliquot in, so it's a semi-closed system. It's non-aerosol, so it uh, is nice in these uh, dangerous situations, PSL2, 3, and that type of thing, or any kind of compromised uh, user situation. and. Uh, uh, so, so that's uh, a big benefit and a big benefit uh, moving forward. Uh, um, the the chip, as you can see over here, this is our this is our call it our legacy chip. It's a little uh, uh, we have now an expanded chip, which uh, kind of maximizes the whole rectangle, and we'll show you that uh, I'll show you that here in a second. And uh, basically, when you aliquot in, you you will use the the chip holder and and uh, close that and pretty easily uh, insert it into the, the system, into the drawer, and it recognizes the drawer and the position of the chip, and uh, you, you're kind of off and running. The, the uh, usability aspects, I mean, this, uh, you know, versus the fax area too, by the way, uh, we get a lot of feedback where people are interested in, in a, a sorter that uh, can, for example, do small sample sizes rather than large, uh, uh, large sample, so so be able to handle uh, feasibly very small samples, but that users from all different uh, walks can kind of come in at all hours and run these things, run their samples on their own, which is kind of interesting. So so not necessarily the core lab, but like 
next to the core lab, you know, where somebody can come in at night and, and uh, run their samples on their own feasibly. So that's that's kind of the where this is finding a home. Uh, this gives you a little bit of a view of the the old chip and uh, you know kind of our our legacy chip and how we've improved it. You can see the microfluidics channels here on the chip. Uh, this is analysis. This is sorting. Uh, the sample is uh, is here, and we do our, use our sample buffer, and and uh, here would be the sheath reservoir. It will uh, will we'll go through and sort this way, and one of these wells will be used for uh, accumulating sheath, which is uh, actually used in the pulse flow uh, uh, mechanism. And uh, when when uh, cells are identified, they're actually then. Uh, popped over here in the collection reservoir and this is this is for waste and you'll see that on the, the bigger chip now we've, we've just uh, kind of uh, tripled the space that we can use for each run so that kind of gives us the ability to you know if we if it took uh, a couple a couple runs to kind of get the job done uh, now if it's a little bigger sample we can handle uh, this was 150 microliters and now we're I think over 350 for the sample, so this is, you know, it's a, it's a big help if you if, uh, if you need it. And again, if you come upstairs, we can just uh, show you all that. So the the couple of first examples I'm going to run through are just uh, a little bit uh, to explain what, the, what um, how we're how we're showing damage free and kind of what examples we've come up with and. And what the what the, the value is, uh, um, uh, we've uh, what we've what we've shown in our examples, uh, it, and and we did some of this at the NIH, uh, uh, really really showing uh, more live cells, more viable cells that are recovered and not damaged in the sorting process. And and what what I've kind of seen out there in in the, the flow world is uh, there's there are some people out there who are already just they, they sort of understand and believe that uh, in the typical sorter there's, there's a high level of damage and that the shear and the pressure of the kind of going through the concentration camp is, is uh, uh, really uh, presenting uh, stress to the cells that they can't get over and uh, and so we not, not, in, not only in terms of dead cells but in, in terms of changing morphology and that type of thing so uh, you know, especially in the case of, like we talked about, uh, being able to culture those cells after recovering those cells. So um, we've done uh, one of the examples that we, we, we've shown uh, with the hippocampus, uh, the, the, the rat cell, hippocampal cells, is that uh, kind of in the competitive sorter that those, those cells die and are not uh, rejuvenated uh, after seven days and to show viable cells uh, with the on-chip sorter. I'm going to show you another example where uh, this is Ishige-san's work. Uh, he can speak to it a little better than I can, but uh, we basically did, uh, uh, Ishige did a head-to-head -head with using the Sony sorter, which happens to be one of the main competitors in the, in the Japanese market. Uh, the Sony sorter, by the way, is, is uh, still a droplet sorter. It still has a nozzle setting type of thing. Um, they, they've made, uh, and, it's, and it's not truly a, uh, uh, a microfluidics-based chip sorter. So, um, what, so basically we put that on its, its most favorable settings and its most favorable pressure and nozzle settings and run the head-to-head. -head and, uh, and we came up with a little bit of a matrix because people were asking sort of what kind of quantitate that for me. So everybody kind of wants to, there, there are some groups like Peter Lopez in New York, that they're, they're obsessed about kind of how, what does damage mean in terms of uh, stress uh, uh, proteins and situations. And, and uh, basically what we did, sort of our first level of, of uh, proof, if you will, is kind of just looking at damage morphology uh, kind of from the picture side of things. And what we've come up with was a little quantitation on uh, what we call budding cells and bursting cells. And kind of looking at that in terms of just counts, just kind of raw data counts. 
and uh, looking at, again, most favorable nozzle settings, and then also looking at what, uh, what is the buffer media that's being, being used uh, uh, for the sample, and what, what effect that might have. So, so this is a pretty interesting slide. We're still, um, you know, fr from 3x to 10x, kind of better depending on how you kind of view this, uh, uh, these numbers here, in, in terms of viable recovered cells. Uh, and then we did, uh, we also did that with uh, obviously more robust cells. We did that with HeLa cells, and we've actually done this in our application lab in Columbus, where we work with HeLa cells, uh, giant HeLa cells, sorted those and kind of looked at the state of cultured recovered cells. Uh, and we, we, we did that in a, a small little hypoxia cell culture device to get a good, uh, good data on that and we get good pictures on that. And uh, uh, so what, we, what, uh, what Ishige did in, in uh, Japan, they actually, this is a great slide right here, kind of looking at even with HeLa cells, it, you know, kind of going through the typical uh, sorter process, getting pretty pretty thrashed, and then what does that mean in terms of uh, culturing, and how many cells kind of come back to life, and how long it takes uh, in ours versus the typical sorter. And in this, this is still, again, Sony at its uh, Sony at its most favorable setting. So this, uh, we got a little bit of feedback that people said, well. It's an unfair to compare it to the fax area too. Well, okay, well, you know, okay, we'll make it a little harder, and, and again, do pretty well against uh, Sony at its uh, at its best settings. So, there's a uh, we're, we're I'm, I'm just going to walk through a couple of examples before uh, Kagisan takes over, and that's just kind of people ask, well, where does it where does this mean something? How does it fit? Who are, who are the kind of the user types? Um, we have a group uh, that we're working with, kind of again coming to Columbus. Uh, that's uh, they've, been, they've done this in Japan, kind of looking at sperm sorting, and they're they're very interested in kind of maintaining the motility of the sperm. So they want these, of course, very active and bouncy uh, sperm, and they want it to be able to kind of make it through the uh, through the channel intact. And so this, uh, this particular experiment right here, where you have a uh, kind of a dual labeling strategy where you're looking at the, the, uh, the head and the tail of the sperm, and then demonstrating that uh, both the head and the tail kind of make it through intact uh, by counting the result and looking pretty good there. We're, we're actually advancing that to kind of take it to the next level to do a kind of a in uh, vitro fertilization type of pre-sort, and we're seeing how we do on that. That would uh, be pretty interesting if we can make some progress on that. Um, this was one of the one of the sorts that we did uh, with uh, the Kelly lab, which is uh, similar, a little bit similar to what Ken's kind of looking at with uh, mouse cochlear neuronal cells. And, uh, you know, this group uh, also was, uh, well, Couple of different, uh, you know, whether it's adult or very young uh, mice, and then the challenges on either one of those in terms of uh, sample recovery, um, and then also these these guys were pretty obsessed about uh, trying to get uh, uh, damage-free samples and clean samples into their C1 or RNA seq, and so that's kind of where we crossed paths with uh, Kevin, kind of looking at how the fluidine kind of workflow, how to optimize that, how to get good samples in there, and also, you know, the, the fluidine mantras, you know, every every cell and every expression is meaningful. Well, you gotta get uh, no no garbage in there, no no garbage in, garbage out. We gotta get uh, good sample in there. And and of course the, the fluidine uh, uh, chip is pretty pretty expensive to run and uh, lots of investment on just trying to get that one sample uh, with two to four thousand cells kind of looking good, so so that's uh, what we're we're looking to do at a number of our customer sites right now. So and we'll see how we do upstairs. Um, uh, just another kind of uh, feature of on chip is that you can change the sample buffer, so you really have a lot of flexibility 
how you change the sample buffer, and some of these examples that are sorting parasites on oysters and oyster sperm, and, and in this case, algae, where it, uh, algae in seawater or lake water, that type of thing, where, you, again, the flexibility of the sample buffer is, is pretty important. And this is, this is a nice example of you know, big algae industry out there where this one in particular is about using the autofluorescence uh, to, to sort the algae species. Pretty nice. And, and then uh, I just briefly touch on, I don't know, uh, this is an area of obviously big interest at NCI, for example, but I've got a couple of I got a couple of papers here that we've done uh, uh, for circulating tumor cells. We're we'll working with uh, one group at uh, Jane Jane Treppel's group at the at NCI, and kind of working to uh, see how what other groups we can work with there at uh, NIH related to circulating tumor cells. Of course, the challenge there is it's, uh, not just hard to recover, but the rare cells. So so we're looking at one one in a million and. You know, what does it take to, to enrich those uh, that cell population before before sorting in order to get viable CTCs? And then, you know, of course, the other thing was we're working on trying to culture those. So we're, show, we're trying to show uh, being able to sort maybe even one, two, three, five uh, circulating tumor cells and then culture those. So, uh, and I've got a couple of uh, a couple of papers uh, to support that in the poster, and you can check that out. And I also have a, uh, uh, the rest of the application deck that I could, that I could give to anyone who's interested. Akagi sounds going to take over and kind of uh, go back to the beginning a little bit on uh, just the review of the instrument and uh, walk you through the fundamentals of the sorting process and, and uh, answer any technical questions you might have. Thank you. generation, so it was something really 
toxic or really harmful to you, you obviously don't want to be standing around it. And sample carryover, which means that you know all the all the whatever the samples that you're running, you're actually letting it run through the same qubit as qubit cost a lot. And so whatever that's sort of stuck in the qubit, if you try to run another sample that was completely different media or whatever you're using, you may have a bit of a cross-contamination from the previous one. And also the sorting damage that I briefly mentioned earlier, um, like I said, high pressure, that actually, you know, all that, um, the, the shear stress that all the cells will undergo is just so high that weak cells will just tend to break away and there you go, when you try, when you thought that you collected your samples, they don't mean anything to you anymore. The culture medium that he also mentioned earlier, we, uh, sorry, the conventional sorters cannot, but they specify particular solutions to use. And I'll go into, well, he's going into a bit of details on that, so I may not touch on that later, but, well, but anyway, as a problem, <coughs> what we need is a closed system so that all the vapors you would not give to you and all that. So just one of the solutions that we came up with is to replace that system with a microfluidic chip system. And I'll just uh, go into that. Advantage of on-chip sort. So on-chip sort is our sort sorting um, flow cytometer. And the advantage to that is biosafety and serial. Because we replace the chip all the time, you get, you get nice and sterile new chip to go. So that actually eliminates the cross contamination at the same time. And damage free sorting, and I'll just, uh, in the next few slides, I'll just give it to the manager. So, how we do these sorting here within the chip is that, as you can see, that these are the microfluidic channels. And we have two, uh, three, three channels combined in, at the intersection here. Using this sheath fluid, we try to squeeze the sample fluid into a narrow flow, which is kind of similar to um, conventional flow cytometer anyway, but this is what we do. We have a channel of 80 micrometers, and the sheath, flu, uh, sheath flow would be in the width less than 10 micrometers. Micro and what we do is we have a chip with reservoirs and we simply apply, apply air pressure rather than mechanical pressure to drive the flow. Because we have air pressure, uh, pressure applied to it, we have no actual direct contact with the solution that you're using. So that eliminates the whole person contamination part of it as well. And um, yeah, I just move on to the next slide. And on the right hand side, you see the chip, the two types of chips that we have. It's called small volume analysis and also large volume um, sorting. Well, they're both, they both are capable of all sorting. So, with yes. conventional sorters, mm -hmm. you can change the analysis. Yes, you can. Right? And so that gives you different widths. That's, that's totally right. And with our case as well, by changing, say, the pressure of our pressure that's been applied to the, um, the sample and also the sheets, we can actually adjust that as well. If that answers your question. Well, but with what we're running off, we just air pressure, so we can change oh. that. Oh, well, no, no, just the, the air, no, sorry, with air pressure that we can actually control how, how much of a push that you have. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we, 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 we're pretty flexible with that. So if you would like to run samples much quicker, we can apply higher pressure. But the pressure that's been applied and also the, um, the shear stress that um, is being applied to the cells is actually a lot lower, as he's mentioned earlier. That's so, so low that it's almost negligible. Anyway, so the velocity of the particles um, that's running in that channel tends to be in the average out to about 0 0.25. Um, meters per second, I don't know if you get that, so um, 
unfortunately it's not in the, the year, but you know who this may be. <laughs> um, which is actually, um, well, I just wanted to show that this is nice and consistent. And just based on, just going back to the fundamentals of sorting, um, we sort these cells using what we call pulse, sort, uh, more pulse, sorry, pulse flows force that um, knocks off cells that's running through a channel and by applying pulse to knock it off to the side channel. And um, the problem that we have, sorry, um, it's not a problem that we have, sorry. Um, if we were to have a channel and also just one single channel, if we were to drive the cells to come to this way, we have to apply pressure from both sides and also this much of the fluid that's suspended in there also goes in. Whereas what we have on our chip, because we have an intersection of the our channels, only that much of the fluid would go into the side channel. So we don't. Uh, what, what this means is that whatever that you don't want is uh, whenever the, the non-target object particles cells that are flowing around here, we can reduce that as much as possible. So it reduces the fluid. Exactly. Or, or that, just, that means that the yield, sorry, the purity of the collected sample at the end, we can just uh, get it to relatively high. But how the chip looks like, so this is the large volume chip that we're talking about, and as you can see, these are the microfluidic channels over there. And what we have, we, we use lasers to Determine if, it's, if the particle that's being through is the one that is a target or the non target. When that's detected, and say that, okay, so now we see a target cell, the pulse air pressure over there, we, we have a quick burst of air pressure applied, knocks off, and get collected. When non targets go through, they just simply run straight. So only select the, the target cells and then um, I don't know if this works so let's see what it does Sorry, it's just a uh, uh, portion of that is just uh, cut off for some reason. So at normal speed, this is sort of the speed of sorting out. And just slow it down. You see the quick pulse of that's being applied from the right. Optics that we have built in the instrument, we have up to three different lasers. And that lasers, if according to what you would like to have, we can change that as well. We can have up to six colors of the recent detection, and obviously the full size and full scatter, and also side scatters. And what's really important is that it's nice and compact, so it doesn't take up too much of your space. Um, it's kind of special because what we have is just a laser coming from the top, going through the chip, and look, look, the fluorescent lights and full, full, uh, full scattered lights will be detected at the bottom. Except the side is on the side, obviously, and also one of the colors is detected on the um, this side as well. 
how we do that size like, detection on the side is that we have a chip and that's where the um, channels are. When all the side scattered lights go through, we have an edge on the chip that reflects it downwards and that was actually focused down and we haven't detected over here. So that actually pre um, reduces the space in the, the overall space of the objects. Next up, there's the sensitivity of um, more, more like the detectors and so on. Um, for some people who's been dealing with um, the uh, bees, for example, they might recognize a little bit, but we can get up to a very low, um, sorry, sensitivity of these, uh, and our instrument is well, uh, very high for that, we can still detect at the very, at the lowest of the lowest, where that's the blank, where uh, uh, we don't see any of the fluorescence, and we can just clearly distinguish between all beats. Talking about the sorting performance, um, the performance of the sorting actually depends on not the concentration of the target that you would like to sort out, but it's more to do with the non-target. And so as you increase the number of non-targets, which is on the x-axis, you would have a um, slight decline in the, um, the sorting performance. However, it's still relatively above 80, and then of course if you have it at the right sort of concentration, you would definitely have more than 90 percent. What we call good is 95, and we can achieve that quite often. And this slide shows just there how, just gives you an idea of how many sorted cells that you can in the end collect. Don't worry about the whole yellow and white part, that just means that you're using different chips. Um, but in the end, we have the sorting time, and depending on the concentration of your target cells overall, that's sort of the numbers that you get in the, in the, in the unit of minute 10. Our operating software is nice and simple. Um, looks like a few bits of buttons, but you don't need to know too much. It's just a few clicks away, and then it's pretty nice and easy to operate. Because what we have with our instrument is that we would like to reduce the hustle that all the users would have to go through. And some of these foresight, the conventional foresight images, they require a trained personnel to run that. Whereas for us, we'd like to avoid that as much as possible. I mean, you know, if you, you'd like to do it yourself, but do you have to actually train yourself to do it that much? It's, it's nice and simple. We just simply, we have a chip. We to be done, transfer these cheese fluid sample and that's just place it in the, in the instrument and then we just run it. That's how easy it is. And um, just a um, you know, bunch of tables with data, just uh, you don't need to focus on to it too much. But just a few things to point out is um, so, like I said, we have up next, we can actually install up to three lasers with options as you can see at the top. And the detection sensitivity I was talking about, this, this in terms of size, um, you can actually get down to about 0.5 micrometers, uh, which is pretty small. And of the, the largest we can comfortably sort is about 40 micrometers. And just because what the channel that we have is up is of the width of 80 micrometers, and something of a half of that width, I think we can, we can still rely on these all. But anything bigger, it's kind of gets tricky. But we can probably get, get over that by having a channel that's a lot wider, and we're trying to get that done. And um, so fluids, we can always a sample and cheese that um, Eric already mentioned. You get to choose which sample, oh, sorry, which cheese or which um, medium, which sample buffer to use. So, you know, whatever that's dam less damaging to your cells, you can do that. Sorting, um, so 
the flow shift method is the, the, what, we, what we're talking about with these pulses to knock it off. And sorting speed, we can get up to 100 cells per second. And um, yield impurity, we, we, we normally say that, okay, this is satisfactory when the yield of your collected sample is over 80, this is 80, but normally 85, and of a purity of over 95%, and we can achieve that, usually. Analysis, so with analysis, which is just simple detection using the lasers, we can get up to 3,000 cells per second. The reason why it's slightly, ever so slightly slower than, um, sorry, I should say ever so slightly, but um, slower than conventional one is just because we're using the narrow passage of the cells. And, but that also means that um, you can run um, small samples, small, small volume samples in a much reliable way and you're not wasting much. And um, yes, so just uh, this is hopefully just important. Um, so our instrument is of this size here at the corner, okay? And of total weight of um, 45 kg, so it's just uh, ever so slightly lighter than I am. <laughs> and yes, so um, that was just on my side, the tech side of the uh, talk here. And thank you for listening. The, um, the comment of the right, that's my, whatever my boss says all the time. He likes, he doesn't make your dream come true, but he would like you to come up with a dream so that you can solve it without it. Thank you very much. Well, for those of you who showed up late, the instrument is actually in room 2C260. If you want to take a look at it, it's on the back wall. And uh, I feel compelled to comment on one thing. Uh, we have an aerosol reduction apparatus on our photon. So you're not going to get sick. <laughs> using using our but we want to make sure that but we avoid even creating that. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I should have to be clear on that. So um, what drives this ninety five percent rate? That strikes me as many wrong cells in the collection bucket. Is it just accidental occurrence of of two cells in the switch volume at the same time? Yes, uh, so the, in terms of purity, I think you're talking about, yes, 95%. So you could, you could address that by, by slowing down your sort and just diluting your sample? Yes, yes uh, totally, totally, yes, oh, totally. But that depends on how much, so time, how much of a time, time you'd like, like to have, you'd like to use just to do the sorting. Okay. And then if you prefer, you can actually run the sorted sample again mm -hmm. to increase that as well. I mean, that's what happens with the conventional sort. Like people will go to like a 125 nozzle, micron nozzle, and they'll get doublets. Their stuff will sort through better, but they'll end up with a good cell and another cell's attached yeah, right sure, to it, sure. and it just. Yeah. When you say damage, do you mean um, mechanical? Uh, usually mechanical, um, some electrical, was because uh, the conventional uh, ones would have to. Have to the all the cells to do the sorting, they would have to be charged to some extent, even though there's a step in the uh, small droplets of liquid. Um, but usually, usually, yes, the mechanical damage, like because they're running through and then some kind of high uh, shear stress that they're under the, um, experiencing, and also when they collide into the pockets, they also burst at that point as well. So recovery can be low for uh, in the case of conventional uh, full cycle. Uh, if the samples are trying, uh, the, if the target that you're trying to collect is somewhat weak in a way. And uh, I think that's a lot of cases that um, some researchers are experiencing. For example, with the, um, with, um, he, he gave a talk about like the, um, the non-damaging sorting using our instrument for um, the neurons, for example, and these things are often very difficult with conventional or cyclometer. So we're trying to go around it by having a totally different approach. You said the sorting rate is like 100 cells per second, yes. right? So if I imagine 100, per, 100 cells per second, 
if we would like to sort something like 10 to the power of 7 cells, right? That's what you normally do with fats. Uh, how much is the sample dilution of the sorting? Um, it really depends on the, uh, because it, like, like if I've shown you in the slide, it's on, it only knocks out the cell and also tiny volume of uh, fluid to the side channel. And um, usually it depends on how much of a, a, a collective sample you want yeah, to Yeah, for have. example, if you have 10 to the power of 7 Okay, so what we have is um, we start off by putting about 50 microliters of um, into a collection, a collection pool to begin with, just so that it's not completely dry. But I think we can reduce that as well. And, it's, and um, it depends on how much like how much we like to have. So what, what sort of concentration are you looking at? So for example, if we want to sort the lab away, it's like 10 to the power of 7 that would you expect to have. And uh, if you start with, like for example, 300 microliter, which has 5 times or 10 times the lab size, do you think like you will have enough sample size or the volume to have 10 to the power of 7 cells? Well, um, or like will it be diluted a lot? Most of the time what happens like sometimes you would like to isolate your DNA mm -hmm. right, from the sorted sample and if it is diluted a lot there are very difficult ways to get them, get the DNA out, out mm -hmm. of it. So what you would do is try to avoid Dilution, yes, 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 yes. So I mean, obviously, um, by salting, we do actually try to get to a higher, much higher concentration. And unfortunately, I don't quite know what how much of the volume is salted in each process mm -hmm. because that's that needs to be calculated using some very complex matrix, for example. Because the flow in a square channel, obviously, at the center is a lot faster than the, at the edges. It's, we have not managed to calculate that, or well, at least I don't know about it, unfortunately. So, um, but in the end, um, we can actually reduce. I'm oh, sorry. We can actually get high, con a lot higher concentrations, and um, you know, just have to start from there. I'm not quite sure. I, um, I can't give you a number, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it should be, it should be relatively okay. But you could adjust that. Yes. The cells are sorted simply through fluorescence detection? Um, well, we can, like I said, um, we, we've got um, seven, yeah, that's right, mm -hmm. eight detectors. So six of which are the fluorescent colors, mm -hmm. and two, one is the forward, forward scatter and then the side scatter. And obviously for people that use a side scatter, the forward scatter um, looks at the sizes of the cells mm -hmm. or the target particles, and the side scatter looks into the complexity of what's in that target. So say that um, cell with um, densely packed organelles, mm. they would have they would come up in the higher region of the side scale. So with the fluorescent detection, the cell itself has to be expressing uh, fluorform um, endogenously in the cell? Not necessarily. It could be a tag? Oh yes, totally, totally. Oh, okay. I mean it is the same as just normal conventional mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be so it's antibody tag. That's to totally the fine. Okay. Yes. So if it, can, if, it, if it did already okay. have, if it, did, okay. if it did already have its fluorescent um, property to begin with, well, oh, that's that's that best. Yeah, you sure, sure. label. But of course, obviously, you can actually um, tag it and um, you can wash it off and then that's all and it's totally yeah. fine. You know, whatever we do in there, um, it just gives a bit of salt if you if you got um, some sort of fluorescent colors. Um, if you don't, then it's, it's simple, often simple, simply just um, determining by the sizes and all the also the complexity. And we can actually, because we've got three lasers and six detectors, we can actually have up to ten colors all mixed up. So if we have ten different dyes in there, we can still get it to sort of sort it out. And then at the end, we can just collect it, the, uh, the particular ones that you want. I have one more additional question to, which is attached to this one. Uh, can you detect between singlets? It should be easy, right, to detect between singlets and the aggregates. Yes. And uh, based on your, like you don't have a real, real mechanical nozzle, so you could, based on the pressure, you could change the uh, micrometer, right? You say 10 micrometer, but you could increase it 
can you sort the aggregate of the cell if we are interested in non, not in the singlets? You see, um, non fluorescent aggregates, I mean. Yes, yes. Um, you see, like, it, it doesn't really matter like, of the focusing. I guess I say that was only, I think it comes down to 10 micrometers of the width, but we've actually run through, say, 40 micron uh, spheroids, so a bunch of cells, cluster of cells, through that with that 10 micrometers of flow. And even though it's a lot bigger than that, it still carries over and it runs mostly fine. So, um, but, um, to stay, you know, I think I'm not quite answering your question there, but um, you can you can totally adjust that and, and uh, just get get it to the right condition that you would like to have as well, and to eliminate the whole either the doublet or just the having the clusters of things running. And, and, and just, uh, there's so many ways that we can control it that you can just whatever, whatever it suits you. We can still do. Yes, um, you mentioned that. Uh, 40 for purity yes. uh, depends on the uh, non targeted yes. particles. So, uh, for, so for each sample, do you have to play around the condition that you know, the ratio of the targeted mm. and the non targeted? Okay, um, I think that the, uh, playing around with the instrument to get the right condition, um, with, the right con with the parameters that we play around when we're when using different sample, it's just uh, usually to do with what sort of media you're using. Yes. Uh, not to do with the um, not to do with how concentrated your targets are. Mm -hmm. It just means that because we have pulse, right? And if they, if your known target is so close, mm -hmm. some of them might be carried into the salting the salter. Mm -hmm. And so the only play around that you may have to do to get high purity is just a little, a little bit of dilution to your sample. But once again, you can use your media to dilute it as well. The, um, the, the play around that I was talking about earlier is just to do this, for example, if you have uh, more viscous or viscous media for some reason, that the, um, the sample flow speed is now reduced and things like that. And also, um, if, your, if, your, if your sample particle is larger, uh, quite a lot larger than normal cells, like I was talking about the spheroids, which is about 40 microns in diameter, that tends to be carried um, through the channel a bit slower, so to get the right settings to have the pulse to knock it off, we just have to adjust that. And, but in terms of the, um, the sort of like the, if you're playing around with normal cells, it should be, well, it should be fine up to about maybe the size of about 45 microns. Then, Beyond that, we just do the, just, the, just a bit of an adjustment to get that right. And it's not meant to be that hard. Okay.